Okay, hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another online series of Loud It Today. I am Ayomi Day Adebisi, and I'm going to be your host for today. Realize Africa brought is the sponsor and the sole owner of this program, Loud It Series, where we get to talk about issues that are pertaining to life. Realize Africa is an NGO that is particular about, you know, raising adults who are particular about sustainable living, who are intentional about their lives, and we advocate against sexual and gender-based violence, we, are, we advocate against harmful traditional practices, and also we promote the sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that being said, that will lead us to the topic of today, amplifying our voices against FGM, because FGM killed Fatun. A lot of people, we ask, what is FGM? FGM is not just another acronym for something else, but it's female genital mutilation. Female gen genital mutilation, which is, you know, any damage caused to the female genitalia, which is of no medical importance. This is female genital mutilation, and it is an act of dehumanization. It is an act that should be banished totally from the, you know, from life, <laughs> because it has caused a lot of harm to, to women, to female folks around the world. Statistics have it, according to the UNFPA, that FGM has affected about 200 million women and girls in 31 countries. Like, we can't have a whole you know, general account of this, but those are the ones that were recorded. Over 200 million women and girls have suffered from FGM in 31 countries, and the rate and prevalence of FGM is known to be of a very high prevalence in Africa. And this has caused a lot of, you know, psychological problems. It has caused a lot of complications, and there is no known medical benefit to female genital mutilation. It is an act that should be banished generally. On the show today, we'll be engaging a very interesting and wonderful lady, Dr. Miriam Dair from Somaliland. She will come talk to us about it later on. So you might ask, okay, FGM, everybody has been talking about it. Then why the sudden upsurge? Well, it would interest you, unfortunately, sadly, to know that in about two weeks ago, a 13-year-old girl died from female genital mutilation. She actually bled to death from female genital mutilation in Somalia. This, we cannot say, is the fault of the parents, but is the fault of FGM itself which is why we have to amplify our voices and actually cry out against FGM. We need to cry out against it and have it totally banished because it is an horrendous act that should be banished totally. We'll, tell, we'll show a story about FGM very soon. So, so Fatun Ahmed Azan was a 13-year-old girl who had the whole life like that was promising, cut short by death in the hands of FGM. She was 13 years old and was subjected to the female genital mutilation, after which she bled to death before she could get medical help. This could have been any other person. This could have been any other person's daughter, which is why we need to keep crying out against this dehumanizing act, because it is an act that dehumanizes women, cutting dehumanizes women, mutilation dehumanizes women. Very soon we'll be bringing Dr. Miriam on live to talk about it. So we'll show a very short clip now about our advocates who voiced out against FGM. All right, so I 
guess we'll get back to that later. So our audience, we really appreciate you for coming on today to listen to us because ignorance kills faster. I'm sure if a lot of people are aware of the armed discourses, that it is of very great harm. A lot of people would not So if you are online, post your favorite emoji and let us know you're following us. So we'll show our video now. She was, she was subjected, subjected to, to FGM, FGM. But, but she struggled with the pain and, and suffering. suffering. She, she never, never gave, gave up. up. Today, she is she's more than a spaz. She is a, a true survivor. FGM has to stop. A lot of girls are at the risk of being circumcised. This, this barbaric, barbaric act has, has to stop. stop. Put, Put an, an end, end to, to FGM. FGM. I, I Rest realize Africa. All right, that was one of our media advocates who actually lent her voice to speak out against this dehumanizing act. And so we're bringing our guest on the show now. Hello, Dr. Miriam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. We're really glad to have you here. It's an honor to have you here talk with us. So please, can you give a, bit, a brief introduction of yourself? Um, thanks. Um, my name is Dahir. I'm a medical doctor as well as um, I graduated like 11 years ago from the medical school and I joined the um, um, the FGM campaign since eight years now, um, so, and also the advocacy in Somaliland. And if nobody knows about Somaliland, um, Somaliland is, is a breakaway region from Somalia, and it is the Horn of Africa. So you can look for that. Um, coming back to me, I think that's mainly I advocate for women's rights especially um, reproductive health rights, sexual reproductive health, FGM, and as well as the, I advocate against the sexual offenses bill, uh, sexual offenses and rape. Um, yeah, that's me. All right. Thank you very much for that brief introduction. You've had like a whole chocolate of working with people to advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights. So apart from being a medical doctor, is it the part of medicine that actually led you to be interested in advocacy for sexual and reproductive health and rights or something else sparked this interest? We would love to know about that. It is kind of a mix. <laughs> I can say a lot of things took me to be an advocate. Firstly, I am a survivor of FGM. I think every Somali woman is a survivor of FGM. I have been subjected and felt the pain, but I was very young, so I couldn't understand much about it. But when I came to the clinical work, I have seen a lot of cases in maternity ward. Women have been uh, suffering from restricted labor. They were having difficulties of birth. They developed fistulas. So I just could get curious about why FGM like this why we have um, this case why we have this kind of practices why if the woman coming to the ward the maternity ward the labor ward having this kind of a very oval act so this is what made me to look to find out what is going on as well as the um, somali community women are not advocates women are not vocal our voice is not heard well because Always they say you can't speak because you are a woman. Your voice is uh, is not being appreciated within the community, and also um, all of that. So women are suffering sexual reproductive health problems. Like they don't go to the 
ANC and local care because they don't have uh, means to go first. They are they are de depending on their men, as well as they are not having education education as well. So these mm -hmm. kind of things make the Somali women to not have rights of anything and mainly their sexual reproduction. So that what wow. made me to come on board, actually fight for women. So yeah. Yeah, that was a very interesting and inspiring story, especially as a survival and speaking about it. Well, so what are the, some of the challenges that you might have faced while coming to fight against this? Because like you said, I can't hear you well, can you? That said to be. Hello, Dr. Miriam. I'm very sorry about that. That was just some connectivity issues. And welcome back. Can you please repeat the question? Okay, I said I'm sorry about that. It was just some connectivity issues. And no yet. All right, so earlier we were talking about while we were in The difficulties and the traits that I, I have been, I think so, you are. Uh, I think um, if, uh, the, the challenges I had earlier when I started the, the advocacy, I was too young. Not too young, but people were seeing me as a young and, um, and a woman, and it was a bit difficult to come in front of the people and a couple of things that is taboo so they were always criticizing me that i'm talking about my thing which means i'm talking about fgm and that fgm is is related with women so the challenge was uh, they i remember one of the workshops that they, one of the, my friends called me to talk about fgm as a medical doctor the complications and everything they actually people walk away because they didn't want to hear these kind of things and um, they were very rejecting. And up to now, um, as I am in the line of the uh, fairest line advocates in Somaliland, especially FGM, women's rights, I receive messages. I receive a lot of uh, texts that threatening me or uh, talking about that I am against Islam, against the culture, against the religion, and as well as the, I am showing the young generation in a, or women, leading women to another and culture or something like that. But I will never stop because this is the cause that I really, really want to come on board. And another woman now joining, there is a whole group who actually now becoming advocates talking about it on social media and one of the great platforms now we have as a somali woman is the social media because there is no other stage we don't have any other stages we don't have we are in the parliamentarian we are not in the decision making table and so things that been women are being engaged on social media very frequently and very uh, great work. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much for that. We really, really do appreciate your resilience. It must have been tough for We appreciate the fact that you are pushing it through and you're actually making it work out. So uh, that will lead us to our next question. So what are some of the lessons that other countries can learn from your country's fight against FGM? And do you think Somaliland is actually winning against this dehumanizing act? Um, if I am starting from Somaliland, and I will come back the lessons, uh, because when there is a challenge, you will learn the, the lessons will come good. Somaliland is not winning the against FGM at all because our government is not um, is not passing the legislation, so there is no legislation, and we are having a challenge that. The, criminalize the FGM. So it become a norm and it still is a norm that it's okay that they can practice FGM. Thanks to the NGOs as well as the advocates like me that we started talking about it and education and educating the community and engaging the community that should use it, the type three, because we know FGM is four types. So the type three, they call it infibulation, is the most severe one. So type three is reduced up to 40%. Because, of the, because it has the more harmful and it is more having more health complications. So mm -hmm. the advocates and as well as the NGOs that have been projected against the FGM or ending FGM, they focused on more on complications. And so the community kind of um, kind of uh, get educated and then people, people went to the schools and they learn FGM is harmful, especially type two, type three. Now they move it to type two. So there is a new trend in Somaliland that people move it from type three to type one or type two, and they call it sunnah. And there was a fatwa from the government who that passed it, and it is uh, mainly <coughs> mainly from the um, religious um, and um, minister of religious. <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, from religious standpoint. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, she'll be back very soon. And so we've been listening to Dr. Miriam talk to us about the types of female genital mutilation and about the four types, the infibulation, and how it has been moved from one particular type to the other to lessen the severity but have not been cancelled. And this is just an outcry to us to lend our voices to this course. This course is dehumanizing. This course needs to be stopped because we could also hear from our experiences as a medical doctor of women who suffer in the labor room. The women who suffer daily to bring children to the world because of these things they have been subjected to. So we'll look at this video. Okay, okay. So she's back and welcome back dr miriam sorry i i don't know i was having a call no this day and then i started there's calling no problem about that. There's no problem it's about that. so yeah and uh, what i was talking about so there is a trend new trend somaliland doesn't have any legislations and i think all somalia does and it's the same as that um people practicing fgm like a normal way like 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 the, it is normal in their life and um, that challenge is, so the lesson is that we learned from that kind of uh, um from somaliland approach to an fgm is that we miss two communities we miss two important um, um important and uh, stakeholders I can say is the grassroots so people were taking information from books to them 
and instead of showing them this is a problem, they were telling them like, you are ignorant, you don't know anything, and this is the right way to do. So there was a very reflection like, no, this I inherited from my grandmother, generation to generation, how you can tell me this? So the, the most important thing that the, all the countries that have FGM in their culture and their community to start talking from the grassroots, from the bottom to up. The other thing, we miss without the men engagement. Mm -hmm. And if I give you a small, give you like a very brief uh, why FGM within, within the community or why people perform an FGM, they need two things to protect the girl from rape. Hmm. Well, as to protect the to to make a more dowry, I see, there is a one day there is a marriage and the girl being getting married, men get may take some dowry from each other. Yes, dowry. I think people know that. Or we yes. can say in Somali, meher. Yes. yes we know. So yes. This, is the, this is the mainly, and it's a, it is a men thing. This practice subjected to a woman to protect from a man and to protect for a man. Hmm? Which means main engagement is important. Main advocacy is important in FGM. Not only women to be advocates, because men are the one who will get privilege to have a girl who is not being touched, as they say. So yeah, that's it. That's the main two areas that the people will love from Somaliland. Mm. Thank you very much for that great insight. So this is a lesson that we're learning that when next we want to lend our voices, we should start from the grassroots. We should lay emphasis on the grassroots and also on the gender. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Miriam. Okay. Okay, she'll be back very soon. So we want to show a very a video very soon, like want to go on a short break. Deliver women in a bad condition. You know, get them in health benefit to realize Africa is a baby. Don't they our girls again? No, they again. No, again. Set up to FGM, no they violate the human rights of the girl. Set up to FGM, I light up when you say you want help the girl. Set up to FGM, no they rob women of their right to life. Set up to FGM, I will get no they mess with their future. All right, so that was a very short video. That was a very short video that is conveying a very large message. And it is in Nigerian pidgin. That was a video by some of our advocates in Nigerian English pidgin language to actually speak against FGM that stop cutting our girls. It has no health benefits. And this is actually the reality. There is no health benefits of FGM. So welcome back, Dr. Miriam. Sorry for that. <laughs> There is no problem at all. <laughs> okay, so now to the recent hop surge on the internet that happened a few weeks ago about the story of young Fatun, may I so rest in peace, who we lost to the fight of FGM. Can you really tell us a bit about her story? Um, yes, it is sad and I really um, like to to have a kind of a moment of silence for every woman or even a girl lost her life because of FGM. It's very harmful and heartache and we can say 
unacceptable to see girls dying of chem at this session or this time that we had a long fight coming back to Fortuna's case she was living in a very rural area and she was um 13 years old and her mother and her father actually agreed to have even thus to how they broadcasted on the we heard about the reports so the young girl if we got in that community must go under the chair and this is a kind of a traditional way. so they call it a tpa or traditional birth cutter who usually perform this kind of a practice to the community or to girls to them to her and then once she cut the girl because um if we can speak about how those women perform practice or perform fgm to the girls is they don't have um very good scissors they only use um, they only use uh, what can say razor razors and as well as they don't use um, anesthesia so they the, the whole operation or procedure goes like a girl being held down by four people opening the two legs with no anesthesia they cut the clitoris all the clitoris they cut it deeply and the clitoris has the nerves and also arteries blood trans blood supply blood vessels so this is the how they cut so sometimes they cut and then they suture it and sometimes they don't cut all of it so they put all two other labia together and they suture it so uh it's kind of a zip so they they cut everything inside and then they they suture or they uh, can I say I have the two big labia and the big big the only they only leave one small hole that they can urinate also the beer can come out mm. so in this kind of a procedure and the gun is just jumping and there is there so they can cut every adjacent vessels um they can uh, damage the blood vessels everywhere so this kind of uh, procedure cartoon had a bleeding they couldn't stop the bleeding they don't have any any material this is in a rural area and there was no any medical any medical and um, help or uh, health center or not any nearby and uh, health workers so sorry for that she died because of that bleeding and later on uh, they took her after 10 hours they took her to the nearby which was up to 10 hours away from her community but she reached there while she was at the last stage or she was taking her last break mm -hmm. so this is a kind of a, it is a mix of it's a mix of act FTM, family and uh, decision lack of uh, medical service and no information share no there is no information at all what the people were thinking that it's a good so it see it shows that we we failed as a, as an activist as um those who are actually managing programs they we failed we failed in this stage and i really need to to say we really need to to rethink approach the approach is that we will end fgm these things is not going Anyway, this kind of approaches are we are working on or activists are in every way or the projects is that um, supporting the 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 advocates is is there but 
one thing I realize it that we really need to, to do more, one 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 mile, one step ahead, or we look up to the level of uh, we can engage those even TPS, the additional bear cutters, and um, yeah, I can say we failed, and we really need to re to rethink how we can reach further. Thank it's very emotional to me. <laughs> Sometimes it's, 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 I can't speak emotional. So imagine it is, such a despicable act. It is really, really very sad. Holding her down there to the point of bleeding to death. Like, I couldn't imagine what could have been going through her mind in her last moments. Like, yes, we failed as a society, but this is a call to action to everybody. So actually lend our voices against this because it is really very sad. It is an act that has no medical benefits. Imagine somebody losing life to something that has no benefit at all just because the tradition says it should be. Well, so our audience, this is a call to action to every one of you to know that we have to do more concerning this. And please, if you are following, please signify by posting your favorite emoji and also let this hashtag trend fgm killed fatun we must end fgm we must end fgm fgm killed fatun we need to lend our voices so that the higher ops can be aware of this and then put a stop to it put a ban to it and save the lives of our young girls save the lives of our sisters save the lives of your wives and every other woman out there Thank you very much for that story, Dr. Miriam. It is really nice to hear of that from you. And it's also very unfortunate that it happened to such a lovely human that could have grown up to become, you know, somebody great and alive and all. Thank you very much for that. Also, so from the Fatun story, I think I was able to deduce the fact that people still employ, you know, the the expertise or should i even say traditional bed quarters to do this horrendous act and all so what are some of the gaps in the story and what are some of the gaps that we can bridge on to work against it because apart from just lending our voice we also have to do more we also have to you know act against it and not just speak so what are some of the gaps so that we can you know leverage on this to actually do more the gaps are uh, i think i touched earlier like um, men are not engaging still men somali men are preferred um prefer to have a woman who's been cut they think it's um uh, they are pure they never they not have uh, outside things or they never seen anybody before the marriage or something like that so it's still I feel like sometimes it's a patriarchy. What 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 pushes what pushes the FPM? Because men, we are actually bleeding men in this way and killing the guys. So this is uh, one of the things I really want. Um, the gap is that we are not engaging men. We are not. We are just speaking to the women and speaking to the health workers and all of that. But the real gap is Somali, the Somali community men are not engaged in these campaigns. So, and, and as well as the traditional cutters, the traditional cut, cutters, how you can control traditional cutters? You need to have a legislation, you need to have a law, and then you catch them. All. If they do this kind of a practice, they have to go certain ways of, 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 of a legal action. So we don't have that kind. Of, uh, of the, the, the gap is the, is the legislation, the gap is awareness and more education. And also, the sheikhs that are traditional leaders are against uh, campaigns or against, they, they are promoting Sunnah, which is not Islamic and doesn't have any value in, um, in any way. But somehow they think. If the girl left like that, if the girl left the clitoris, she will not be, she will have a more, uh, what I can say, they think that she will have more feeling 
and she will go outside somewhere. This kind of a, it is a shameful to say like that thing. But I feel that the religious leaders actually put that kind of emphasis on the school up because they said, they said, cut it a small way. It's in a small, so the girl would think that she is not, she's kind of a demissive uh, feeling. So they, she doesn't have any feelings for anybody except her husband. And I think I said earlier, she was a collusion that the women actually want to control the sexual life of the women. So um, the garbage is that the religious leaders should come on board and legislation should come on board and, and as well as the men, men who are actually young or elderly because elderly, those who are having, and if you see the case of the, of a tool, when they were speaking with her father, he was saying like, this is, should happen, or I allow it to happen. So fathers must be engaging to not allow their girls to do such kind of a practice. Mm. And yeah, that's the mostly the gaps that I have seen. And the other thing, there is no harmonizing message. So everybody, I, I promote zero tolerance, or I promote to I promote to um for FGM forever all the times of FGM. There is another advocate who speaks about only chronic and they promote Sunna. So also there is no harmonizing approach. And then it's so FGM is and Thank you very much for that. This is Dr. Miriam telling us there is no importance to it, either to Suna or to the other types, that there is no medical importance. And also that the gaps that we have witnessed most times are from the leg absence of legislation, like the ab absence of legislative stand against it, mm -hmm. and also religion mm -hmm. and also the men. This is a an outcry and a call to our legislative arms, our religious leaders, and also the men, the male gender, to help us amplify our voices and put an end and a stop totally to FGM. Thank you very much for that. And also to our followers, to our listeners, to our audience, who would appreciate if you could make this trend, post it on your social media and those post it on the comment section and let us know that you're standing with us against FGM and also pass the message across to every member of the people we've mentioned, the male gender, the elderly, the religious leaders, and actually tell them that there is no importance to FGM and the reasons why it should stop. So Dr. Miriam, as regards um, everything you've told us, we know a lot of this because actually, what the video when the father was being interviewed as regards the case and it was very sad there was remorse there was sadness all over his face and it said something it was like he never knew this would happen and that brings us to the fact that a lot of people are blindly following this tradition without knowing the effect it actually causes so a lot of people are following due to ignorance and they are on willingness to actually question what is going to happen so we would love to hear what are some of the things can we say ignorance is a chief player in this and how can this ignorance be averted thank you i think some people actually um we can we can say like it is two ways ignorance and also suppression so we can say uh, when it comes to the ignorance yes many people are following it many people think that it's a tradition must be uh, gone on and somalis are actually or somali women should will not be added to a somali woman as unless she have a fgm some of them they think that's a religious so you will not be a woman you will not be um, be you. You can't pray. You can't do this because of you can't be a real one hundred percent Muslim. You can't pass 
the bubble unless you have unless you have this kind of FGM. So yes, it's a true ignorance, one hundred percent. But there is something that we can say. It is a. Uh, there's something that's subjective because we can say gender-based violence. So when if there's rape happens, people blame a woman because she was why she was there and why she was doing this and why she was wearing this kind of dress. And I think it's the same. So if the woman is not cut or not clothed, and she had uh, this kind of rape to say that this is the problem, you know. She should be um, and, and, and sip it, yeah, ah, and but they can say she should be sexually it, is, and then she can be um, uh, protected. So I'm I can sorry. say it is a uh, yeah, it, it is ignorance, but sometimes I say it's kind of a violence because it's a violence against the woman to control her sexuality to control, to make more privilege or more preference to help the men to please themselves. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, actually perceive the family's name. Because if the woman, I remember one of the girls who came back from Arab countries to Somali, and uh, to Somaliland, and then one of their um, daughter being married, and the guy actually divorced her had the second day of her marriage because she was not cut and she was not sutured actually. She was not have three. So all her the family took all her six sisters and they 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 perform FGM, especially have three, because married. Yeah, I think it's a, it is it is it is a community ignorance and also mm -hmm. violence against women and mm -hmm. and it's a human rights issue we can't say like uh, you are ignorant you don't know anything you are <laughs> we can't excuse them they should stop yeah yeah thank you very <laughs> much that was dr miriam their own rights to life, their own rights to choice. And so yeah. we can't excuse them as regards ignorance because a lot of them just want to control. And also, this is also telling everybody out there that every human, it be it a boy or a girl, has a right to life, has a right to choose what happens to them. And so we should allow them express this rights. Food. We should allow them live their lives. We should allow them live their lives without the problems and the complications associated with FGM. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Miriam, we know you are a very, very strong advocate against FGM. We know you're an activist. So what are some of the activities? What are some of the actions that you've taken to speak against this? Um, I... Actually, I engage, I engage more on um, now currently, and if I speak from my campaigns, I, I work with young people because I felt they had the hope. So okay. we found and we have a, a group called, um, sorry, that's my bells. <laughs> um, okay. Let me open. All right. Okay. So far, so good. Dr. Miriam has been telling and talking to us about FGM, about how this is something that should stop. We'll play a video now. All right. Okay. So we'll play that video later, but still, we just want to keep hammering on the fact that FGM has no medical benefit. It has no medical importance. It is something that has to be stopped because every day, every hour, a girl is being caught. Okay, every day, every hour, a girl is being caught, and this is something that affects them as they grow up, even in later life, bearing of children and all, it still keeps 
affecting them. And also, we need to let the legislative arm of government in our countries be aware of the fact that this has no medical importance. This has to stop. We also have to keep preaching this to the religious leaders and also know that this culture, this particular tradition, is of no importance. Rather, it causes more harm, it causes more complications. And also, we'll say no to FGM. I said no to FGM. I said no to FGM. I said no to FGM. Girls are dying, girls are harm. Save their lives and raise their lives. Say no to FGM. Say no to FGM. Say no to FGM. No, said no, said no to her GM. I said no, no, no to female genital mutilation. Oh, I said no to her GM. I said no to her GM. And, and female genital mutilation. All right, so that was one of our products of the Young Media Advocates that was preaching actively against FGM. She lent her voice to produce that music that says we should end FGM. And to our audience, there is this question. The question is, if you had a chance to put an end to FGM, what would you do? If you had a chance to be in a parliamentary setting and you were asked a question, or you want to lend your voice and you know present and tell them this is the act I would this is the act I would love us to take to end FGM. What would it be? Please let us know your answers in the comment section. Ignorance is not an excuse. FGM does no good to a girl or a woman. Rest in peace, for soon. Thank you very much for keeping me comfort. Thank you for that. Ulama Iwaju, rest in peace, for soon. FGM killed for. From comfort, FGM was stop in our society. It has to. It's absolutely has to. And also, we have a summit to look at where end FGM, FGM killed Fatun. So, okay, if you had a chance to, you know, send the message out there, what would you say? What action would you say the government should take to put an end to FGM? And, okay, we have... Oleg Bese, Ulua Kemi, FGM Kid Fatun, and FGM, thank you very much. Thank you, Asabe. Thank you, Gideon. Thank you, Omar Wankus. This, Abdurizak Omar, thank you very much from Somalia. Thank you. Is this someone you know from Somalia? I was Somali meeting. All right, that's that's a Somalian greeting. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for engaging. We have Sadiq Mohamed, the Tomerian. Thank you very much. She's doing absolutely well. Lua Maiwajo will see you. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Miriam, there's plenty of love for you from here, from Nigeria. We're sending you loves from Lua Maiwajo. Thank you very much. FGM Kid Fatun, rest in peace, Fatun. All right, so. We are about rounding up. So you've already told us some of the gaps and some of the actions which you should take. So an advice to us as young people, as adults, as people who want to lend our voice against FGM because we know it is absolutely wrong. It shouldn't be practiced at all. What advice will you give to us? Because every day this horrendous act keeps happening. Every minute, every second, the girl is being caught somewhere. And it's like the more we keep trying, the more it keeps happening. So what advice would you give to us activists to actually speed up our actions and our words against this act and so as to make it stop on time? Um, actually, to the young people, we really need to speak out. Um, we shouldn't allow our girls to be cut and our sisters to be cut. And we know we are the one who we were saying the earlier people are were ignorant, but now we are educated. Even if you are not that much educated at the university level, you have you can Google it. You can see if they told you that the 
this is what I tell them, my young people, because we have a network called Youth and the FGM Somaliland. So Youth and the FGM Network, we, we advocate against the FGM through social media, through through engaging young people. And actually, we always speak to them in action. We tell them like, a, declare now. We need you to declare that you fight against the FGM within your community, within your family. If you are not even having more say to your community, you can start from your home. We speak, we speak to the young mothers. We engage them. We taught them like this is not, we show them the role models. Because I have two, two girls, one of them is 13, the other one is 11. And I'm not, I not, not cut them at all, and I will not do that. So this is kind of a role modeling, actually, that I show others and say like, no, I don't have any harm. My girls are very healthy and very beautiful. I will not cut them at all. So one of the things actually, we need to have this kind to have a role model to be a role model to speak about it because of gm is every business every day you will see or hear a girl being cut or he is suffering of GM. men or boys should stand and say we don't prefer a girl who has been cut because let me tell you, all this practice is being done for you. So you are a biggest stakeholder to say no. Mm. We want the girl to the way Allah created her, the way Allah, God created her. Because nothing, nothing, nothing is there. Nothing is harmful in the woman's body. So why should we do this kind of a mutilation to put you to please you? Ah, so young men must stand up and speak about FGM and tell them tell their preference, declare their action against FGM. They fight in their houses, in their communities, speak to their peers. They sit in the tea shops, they see coffee shops. They must speak about it because it's a business of every day. Every day, every day, or every minute, a girl be cut. Why we are not talking about every day? It's not like uh, we wait the 6th, 6th of February. We don't, we don't, I actually don't do that today. I boast about it. I speak about it. I engage with others. Yes. So even social media, we can create WhatsApp groups. We can challenge each other. How many people you have reached? How many um, you spoke about it? Even if, every day I learn something about it. Literally every day. If I speak about it, somebody will tell me something that I did not know. The myth that we in the community. There's mm. a lot of myth that's happening and it's going on. And you don't know how to do how how to how to approach it because if you speak about one, there is another one. So creating platforms, speaking to the young people, um, young mothers, young fathers. Let us end FGM within a generation. Let us not have, let us not harm our girls in our future. Because right. FGM has a complication. medical complication, is a clinical complication, is a psychological complication. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of girls who drop from this because of FGM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I start, I will not stop. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, we're actually enjoying it. You actually mentioned something. You mentioned something about you learning something every day and some meats. Would you care to share some of these meats with us? And the myth is that, the, you know, a clitoris, if you leave the clitoris, it will elongate and it become like a, like a, a big, a long, like... <laughs> It is something that that myth. It is very, very against it. Um, what I can say, uh, medical terminology or medical um, or how it's a uh, normal anatomical way. There is nothing elongated. So they think that the if you leave the clitoris, it will grow very long. That one, and it will not please a man, a woman who have elongated clitoris. The other thing is that the is the 
Women's sexuality will be is too high. It's like um, it's too much. So we need to cut it half to meet the man's satisfaction. Um, the other myth is the beauty. So they think that the woman, if she has clitoris, she will not have many. She will not clean herself, or she's not clean, or there will be some in. Um, bad smelling will come out or something like that. So there are a lot of uh, myths, and I remember one of the myths in uh, one of the countries in Africa is that if the woman has a clitoris, her child will die. Yeah, so every day you will hear one thing that is uh, unrealistic, but it's been um, it been harmed or you can say a girl suffered because of that lie. So we really need to fight against FGM and remove all this myth, and all these mis misconceptions and about women is, women is pretty. I think mostly in Africa, women is pretty is misunderstood. misunderstood. They can say rather. Because they yeah. say, always they will talk about something that you have no evidence in, in medical field. <laughs> they will talk about this and that. So it is more education. It needs more education. Where the source of the information is from. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Miriam. Awesome. Okay, so because a lot of African women now have been survivors of FGM and we mm. have a lot of people that in their relationship they find it so hard to open up to their partners that they've been caught or they've suffered mm. FGM so how do we balance this together how do we balance the issue together can you repeat sorry okay we have some people who have been caught some women who have been caught and then they find it difficult to open up to their partners. They find it difficult to be bold in their stand because they've been tell their partners that they've been caught or in other cases, to stand up against their partners advising their daughters to be caught. So where do we balance yeah. this? Um, first of all, we really need to, to give a voice to the woman yeah it, it it is it is a kind of you know this kind of privilege this kind of superiority of men having is in african communities and especially some Malay community so and um, you will see a lot of women are not talking to their men openly because they respect them or women should be silent when she's with her husband and uh, sexuality is again another challenge they don't talk about it at all they'd be either being cut or she will be having a painful because if the fgm happens to you and they open it at the at the, at the night of the wedding uh, they cut the girl and they ask the men to, be, to do it because of it will it will heal again together <laughs> so it's a painful something painful happens to them they never had a pleasure. The first day they experienced something, they they felt the pain. So they never speak about it. They never. So this kind of a, uh, this kind of a lack of communication, woman doesn't have any voice against the community, society, men, all this kind of thing. And that we started from a young age. We tell the girls to keep quiet because they are girls. Because you are a girl, you have to be silent. You have to be kind of a, so we really to need to empower girls to empower to speak about themselves to stand up for their rights and now i know one girl women are not speaking standing for their rights of family planning because their men doesn't want it which means that the lack of women's empowerment and I think women are being, they, they are focused. Women are really very interesting um, um, 
creatures but very interesting they they have they are focal they are very energetic but when it comes to the society that suppressing them um making them to not speak about anything about their rights not standing up starting from a young age that they are girls and they shouldn't speak this all of the things to be stopped uh, and and women to be had thank you very much for that dr miriam that has really been insightful okay so Ali Matsu, thank you very much for your great work. Thank you for helping in our advocacy programs. Comfort, thank you. Keep up the fabulous work. Thank you also, Comfort, for lending your voice to advocacy in your region. Thank you very much. So, okay, there's this um, question that was sent by an audience. It says, is it sooner to cut a private part of a baby girl when she's given birth to? Is it sooner to cut a little part of the private part when she's given birth to? Um, sooner is type of FGM, which means it's a violence against the FGM. And it's a violence and against, against the woman. It's a, it's a, you know, as I said earlier, FGM is a four, four types. Sunna is type one. So it's an FGM. Sunna is an FGM. It's female genital mutilation, and it is not allowed. It is not. Um, it, it is a form of FGM, so you shouldn't perform anything like that. You work out when she's born or elderly or young or whatever. Thank you very much for the clarification. Suna is just like um, something that they sugarcoated. The type one, they make it like a more to sound to sound more um, more religious, more Islamic. But it's type one. Hmm. Thank you. So to the person who asked that question, Sunnah is also a type of FGM, and it should be avoided at all costs. It should be preached against. Okay. So now coming to the issue of survivors because we have some survivors who have undergone FGM like infibulation, whereby the old labia majora is sewn, sealed off. And then they've been in relationships that, you know, there's this low self-esteem, especially when it's time to come clean with your partners and the partners discover they've been sewn or sealed off. And then sometimes most of these partners run away. They actually run away. And then there is this feeling of, low self-esteem that the survivor keeps feeling so what advice would you give to such women to such girls that must have undergone this and this is affecting their self-esteem so much um you were breaking so i just got it like the survivor is not suffering a lot they are not speaking about it and they're been uh, Okay, in relationships, people who suffer low self-esteem in their relationships because of FGM. Yes, actually, I remember when I was in a labor ward, women were not happy about their look down there. And because it looks awful, actually, when it is um, FGM, it doesn't, it does is not look like a good a good a good performance a good um look you there is they cut everything they switch it and then they reopen it so yes yeah, self-esteem is low and women are not actually it, it affects psychologically and fgm is not only harmful to the physical but also to the to the psychological so women having a lot of psychological problems a lot of ptsd post-traumatic syndrome is a stress syndrome. If you speak to women as survivors, you they will tell you still they can they can feel the same pain that they had the day of the cut. So it's kind of a, um, feeling the pain doesn't want any any, any sexual relationships and um, with their partner, their husband, 
all of these kind of things putting them in a low self-esteem as well as they're uh, not satisfying themselves so as well as the, the their partners and there is a lot of huge and um, um, number of the men who actually marry another woman again in a, in a very young age because um, it, they claim women are not having and, and they're not satisfying them not kind of a uh, it needs to work and uh, to establish a counseling center for survivors and an FGM survivors to speak to, to each other and learn from each other and to increase their self esteem as well as their confidence. And um, there's a lot of survivors who are actually having a good life, good relationships, good, and uh, how, how their house is, is, uh, is stable. So they really need to have that those that, those kind of a uh, of, of 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 platforms. We really need. We don't have that kind of platform. Is that the cheap and and cheap if you survivors or FGM survivors to speak to each other and learn from each other and get experience and also lift each other more or less. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, I think our audience, we appreciate you, Madam Alima too. Thank. You for the great work you're doing to preach against FGM. You are an icon. We appreciate you so much. Madam Comfort, we also appreciate you for the work you're doing, the advocacy against FGM. We'll see you. We appreciate you. We want more of you. And hopefully, we'll also have young people who are going to also be joining and fighting against this cause soonest. And also, so now I want to know more about our guest because she has done so much I am doing justice to FGM and the work she has been doing also want to learn more about her. So on a lighter note, madam, we'd love to ask you that what are the top three most admired personalities in the world for you? Who are the top three most admired personalities in the world for you? That you like to meet <laughs> them. <laughs> Ali Matu is one of them. <laughs> I met her in Senegal. But I really want to meet her um, uh, more and speak to her and thank you for her for her uh, great work and uh, yeah and as well as I wish if I met uh, Nelson Mandela our okay. lateness and the lateness and Mandela because I felt like uh, there, there is a there is a huge um, um, he did he he fought for something for a cause and I'm fighting for that he, he took a lot um, of his energy and time to liberate the uh, black africans or south africans and i think i'm doing something for i don't i don't call it similar but something look like that uh, for somali women so i actually want to learn and a lot of, of that as well as um i want to Alan Alan Johnson, the fairest president of um, women, African president of women, I think so. So Alan Johnson, I think I really want to meet her and speak to her. And yes, Hiba Wardare. Yeah, a lot of uh, our GM campaigners. And I, I wish we all come together one day and work. Madam, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we admired you too, Dr. Miriam. Thank you. So hopefully she also looks forward to meeting you too. So hopefully that will happen soon. <laughs> and thank you so much for that. So Comfort says, yes, my hero, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela really fought a good cause. He did well for Africa generally and South Africa mm -hmm. in fighting against the apartheid system. All right. So now what are the top three books? that you love so much and why do you like them? Yes, uh, when I joined the, the campaign, the FGM campaign actually, I was not that much, um, I was not that much informed or uh, uh, get more uh, information about it. And because the type of FGM I had, it was a small type two, or you can say type one, so I wanted to know more about other times. I got this book from Hiba Wardare. It's called One Woman's Fight Against 
FGM. Okay. So, what that is, is about FGM. And actually, I learned from high experience. She put amazingly high story into a book that everybody can learn from that. And how she felt it, how she started, and how it ended, and how she became. And that book actually inspired me to become the person I am. So I'm going to give over to a Somali woman living in Britain. Yeah. Uh, same journey, same level, and of 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 of, of the society that she was living in. So, yeah. All right. So I was uh, my the name of that book. So can you please like talk about the name, the title of the book? It's called it one, one woman. It's like in a self. One woman. One woman is fight again a self chair okay one woman's fight against fgm thank you very much for that yes yeah. so what are the other two books and the other two books is the the one with the for the biography of um wangare matai and the, our Nobel peace prize winner the environmentalist and she had a yes and um, from kenya and we had a similarities in our, I can say like, uh, I am three, I have three children, I have been divorced and I got, I had a lot of um, a job and professional dilemma that I need to go out of the, my country or my region. And yes, and she had kind of, uh, actually that book inspired me because of the, I saw, I got that book early it was 2016 when I read, and I felt I can do something for my children and also for myself and for my country and for my cause I'm working on. And she actually did well. And um, yeah, that book inspired me because it had uh, some kind of a uh, similar story of what I was going on in that time when I read about it. And still, I have that book. My third book is the is a book that is not related with any african and it's called what, what got you here won't, won't get you there which got means you. how the attitudes that you have now will not take you the next level you have to learn you have to do a lot of work research to become another the person that you aspire so uh, what got you here what got you there and and by the author of Marshall Goldsmith. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miriam. We would love to, you know, also read these books and also learn lessons that you were able to learn. And yes, Grace Adamo. I think Grace says there should be more campaign to the grassroots, especially the traditional bet attendance on FGM. So the question that says, if you had opportunity, if you had an opportunity to talk to the legislative panel on actions to be taken to fight against FGM, what would you do? Grace says there should be more campaign to the grassroots, especially the traditional bet attendance. I think that. We'll get back to that later. So I guess Dr. Miriam has connectivity issues. We'll add that to the stream later on. And so we've learned so much about we've learned so much about FGM and how we can amplify our voices against FGM. It started with Dr. Miriam telling us about the types of FGM that there are four different types with the type one, which is the part where you just cut the clitoris away. Then she talked about infibulation, which is the type three, which means sealing the external genitalias um, temporarily to when she's ready. With all this, all this are acts that we should speak against because just with the description, it is so dehumanizing and it is so horrendous. And it is something I, I don't wish on even someone's worst enemy. So we have to jointly speak against this. Also, she told us about some of the gaps that are in the system that has made FGM go beyond how it should. Some of the gaps which are, you know, 
the religious aspects who believe who they believe that it is a tradition that should be practiced in our religion, which shouldn't be so because it has no medical benefits. She also talked about the lack of the legislative panel making a strong foothold against it. So this is a call to our people in legislation that this, there should be a strong foothold against it. We should preach against this. We should stop it. We should ban it. And then she talked about engaging the men, the men that most times people practicing this act are because they want to pre, they want to protect the women. They want to protect them in their own ways, protect them against the men for the men which shouldn't be so that men we need men needs to speak up men needs to cry against fgm that we don't want our girls caught we don't want our women caught we don't want our wives caught they, this tradition is doing this for us but we are saying no we don't want it and if they can have an assertive voice against this then it is going to stop then as to women who are married who have, who have survived fgm and now needs to take a stand and a foothold against this same thing happening to their daughters you need to be assertive you need to explain you, you need to educate the men in your lives on why fgm shouldn't be practiced and also for people who might have survived and you know still living with self-esteem low self-esteem issues, living with PTSD, that is post-traumatic stress stress disorder that you might be facing from the acts in the past, you could create platforms where you engage with each other and also talk about it because talking about it helps educate each other and look for ways you can lend your voices against this act. And so, so our last question for you, Dr. Miriam, can you describe yourself in three words? <laughs> <laughs> That's most most difficult one. <laughs> um, I'm focal. I can speak um, about anything. I don't fear. I don't have any fears. So when it comes to the to the rights of the of the girls and women, and also the the unfortunate ones and weak ones. Also, I think I speak from my heart, so, and I'm honest. So uh, that's the three things I really, I think I'm, yes. I can describe myself. <laughs> I think you forgot to put your resilience, you're a strong woman. <laughs> Yes. So thank you very much, Dr. Miriam. We appreciate our audience. We thank you for your engagement. And also now, finally, what is your advice for aspire, aspiring young FGM and FGM advocates for young advocates that want to, you know, speak against FGM? What is your advice to them? Because, of course, there are going to be challenges. But how do they overcome these challenges? One thing, everybody at the, at the beginning of your journey, people will reject you, will silence you, will not hear you, will, yeah, will point fingers to you. I remember one of the times I was working in a clinic and my family actually was very angry about me because other people told them that your, woman, your um, daughter is working in an HIV clinic she is contracting HIV, why she is doing this. So, and that was a great cause that I work with the people who actually needed me and needed my support. So never listen to others and be resilient. Actually, resilience is most important one. Be focused and have one vision. My vision is to end FGM and also to speak about women's rights wherever I am, so this is one of the things that people are not you don't have kind of a um kind of a, a dilemma or something like that be strict to your cause and what you are speaking out and learn what you are working on you have you have to do a lot of research and learn what you are doing so will not have a backlash so people will, will when they the people like ask you very hard questions 
sometimes people ask me about the religion and I really know the religion very well. Um, so whenever they, they want to quote me and they say like, you are, you are doing this and you are, this is against the religion. I speak about it. I say like, no, you can't say things. It's not, that it's not the religion. So know what you are doing, be resilient, have focused and do do what 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 makes you feel better this from the heart you feel like that. is this how it needs you are you happy with what you are doing and what? all right thank you that was one great advice be focused know what you're doing be resilient be informed about your mm. course so when people ask you hard questions you know how to answer them tactfully. Thank you very much, Dr. Miriam. We look forward to more engagements with you because we work with girls and we would love them to engage with you and also learn more from you because you are an icon. You are somebody we look up to. And also our audience, thank you very much. Comfort says she will let people know that FGM is a crime as much as an attempt attempt murder and even murder for cases like fatoons and also she says i admire your resilience and damn okay madam alimatu says she loves that she loves your advice to the young advocates and madam comfort thank you very much well done she says be sensitive that is also an advice to young advocates be sensitive Dam Lola says an educative section it has been thanks Dr. Miriam we appreciate you and she says well done Ayomi thank you very much then Dam Lola says as advocates resilience is key I think this point cannot be overemphasized you have to be resilient and so we look forward to working with you. We look forward to having more engagements with you. And also, this is a call to people out there, to watch people watching us. If you want to join, we are open to receiving people, young advocates, who, who will train to actually learn voices and amplify voices against social vices like this. So if you want to join, you can follow us on our media pages and also send a message to us on our Facebook Instagram and other social media pages, do it right, our gene. And also we look forward to having support from people, from you. If you want to support, if you want to support us, you can be a change agent, you can help support, you can also join as advocates. And also we appreciate our boss who has been helping with the technical and the media. So far, thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Miriam. Thank, thank you, Madam Comfort. Thank you, Madam Alimatu, for your work. And we hope to get more of you. And from us to you, we say goodbye.